as we were singing, one of our, our members of the church, they came up and just shared that uh, God just really dropped in their heart the passage of scripture where it talks about, as we were singing about being a child of God, that sometimes we can be afraid to enter into that family thinking we're, we're going to lose, but the whole crux of the, the passage is no, actually we gain. That when you enter into the kingdom of God, you gain brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and grandparents. Uh, and we're going to talk about coming home today, and it, it applies well that if God leads you to the place of, hey, you're meant to be a part of the family of God, which we all are meant to be a part of the family of God, that's God's heart for you. I just uh, pray that you hear this morning, it's not that you, you lose, you gain, and, and that's really the heart of God for you. So uh, the message that I'm going to get into as it relates to coming home, I was thinking about kind of that theme, and, and Shelly and I went to Southeastern University down in Lakeland, Florida. My last three years of, of college were there, uh, and that was far, because my family lived in the Chicago area, and so that was a, a far distance to try to get back and forth to school, but it didn't really matter to me. You know, we worked it, worked it out. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the Thanksgiving breaks that I had was my third year of being there, and I wanted to go home for Thanksgiving. Uh, sometimes I didn't get home for the holidays. I mean, Christmas, I always got home, but, but I really wanted to get home for Thanksgiving. I just, I love Thanksgiving in our home, so I thought, you know what? I'm going to go. Flying wasn't an option. I was a college student. I didn't have money. <laughs> Gas is cheaper. So decided to, to drive. Challenge is it's 18 hours door to door to get to Chicago from Lakeland, Florida. So I woke up early on a Tuesday morning, drove all the way there, got there late Tuesday night, hung out with family for Thanksgiving, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then drove all the way back on Saturday just so I could finish the semester. Lots of time in the car. And why would I do that? I did that because there's just something about there's, there's no replacing coming home. There's something about going home. If you're from a good home, there's something about going home. The, the sights, the, the smells, the conversations, the relationships. Uh, there's just something about going home. Home is a, a great place to be. And what about you this morning? Have you ever done something that you felt like, man, I, I came home for this or came home for that. It seemed a little crazy at the time, but I did it because I just wanted to go home. There's something about home. When I say the word home, what images come to mind? What word pictures? As we head back into our series in Luke today, we're going to come across a story of a son coming home. And it, it's a great story with a lot of lessons that we can take away from it. And I pray that we do. So if you have your Bibles, hey, I hope you've got a Bible with you today. If you're new to Connection Point, we uh, encourage you to be in God's Word daily. There's a Bible underneath the seat in front of you if you don't have one with you today. We're going to finish uh, Luke chapter 15 today. I invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. So Luke chapter 15, we're going to be reading verses 11 through 32. So a little bit longer reading this morning, but great takeaways for us today. And he said, so Jesus sharing and, and talking with the crowd that's there, he says, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that's coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this is my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. 
His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. These are the very words of God. You may be seated this morning. So we left off in Luke at the beginning of December. We took some time off for Christmas. We had a missions weekend in there. And now we're headed back to Luke. And I need to let you know, next January, we finish Luke. I know, what are we gonna do? We'll find something. There's a few more things in here that we could talk through probably. (laughs) <laughs> so we're in Luke chapter 15, we'll finish it next January, but we left off in Luke beginning of January, actually the first part of chapter 15, and in there, uh, Jesus shares two stories, the story of the lost sheep and the lost coin. And in those two stories, what we understood from them is that we are responsible, that we must bring people to Jesus. We're supposed to bring people to Jesus, and we rejoice with all of heaven when we do. Those parables are, are great to help us understand what happens in heaven as we on earth bring people to him. That's an amazing thing. And now today we're going to get into the third of the lost stories. So the the lost sheep, the lost coin, but now it's a lost young adult. And from this story that we're getting in today, what we're going to land on, what we're going to find is that our home is with God. Our real home is with God. And that's meant to be the case for both of the sons, as we'll see in, in walking through this story this morning. But maybe for some of you here today, you've never really found your home with God. You don't know God that way. Or or maybe your home was with him, but you've walked away, kind of lived a different life, and and you're here this morning, you don't even know why. But God knows. He has a reason for you being here today. Or maybe you're here and, and you've been in church for a lot of years. But part of what this story shares this morning is you can actually be in the same vicinity of, of where we worship and celebrate God, but you can actually still not be at home with him. So are you at home with God today? And if you're at home with him, what are you doing to help others find their home with God? These are some of the applications today. So no matter where you find yourself this morning, there's, there's lessons to be learned in the story that we're walking through. But I want to go ahead and start at the very beginning and, and just walk through this narration. And, and what we first start with is those that are far from God, what you're going to find is, is that you are welcome to come home, even if you feel like you've offended God. You are welcome to come home even if you think you have offended God. The story that that Jesus shares, this younger son, he goes and approaches the father. So the setting is, it says that there was a man who had two sons. That's our setting. And then we enter into what is the relationship the father has with the younger son. It obviously wasn't a very good one because the younger son comes to the father and says, give me my inheritance that I might leave your home and go elsewhere. So there's a strain in relationship there. Kenneth Bailey, in a book that he wrote, Poet and Peasant, he's he's great at at dissecting Middle Eastern culture. He lived there as a missionary kid, is fluent in Arabic and Aramaic and and Hebrew. I mean, so it just has a great understanding of the the parables of, of Jesus. And as he was traveling throughout the region, you know, he, he would ask people for 15 years, he was reading this story and asking them questions from Morocco to India, from Turkey to Sudan, and he would ask them, could something like this happen in your village? And all of them, everyone would say, absolutely not. He said, you know, could this son ask this father this question? And they said, no way. And, and Kenneth said, well, what would happen if he did? They said, well, the father would beat him. And and Kenneth Bailey says, well, why would he get beaten? Because what this son is saying is, Father, I wish you were dead. That's the equivalent of what he's asking. That's what he's saying right there. He says, Father, I wish you were dead so that all that is going to be left to me, I could take and go elsewhere. But he asks it while the father is still alive. That's the offense of all offenses. Even in our Western culture, that's horribly offensive. Can you imagine going to your parent? Mom, dad, wish you guys would, would die so I could get what I've got coming for me. What's your dad say? Oh, I'm going to give you what you got coming for you. <laughs> it's no different in that setting either. Man, so he, the offense of all offenses. But think about the response of the father. Does he beat the son? 
No, he actually gives what he has asked for. What kind of demonstration of love is it that this father says, I will send you with what you want? Why? Because I can't force you to love me. The father wants the love of his son, but he knows I can't force it upon you. The same thing holds true for us. God has tremendous love for you, but he cannot force you to love him. He can't force it upon you. I was thinking about, for Shelly and I, we, we daily, multiple times daily, we tell our kids, we love you, love you, Nate, love you, Lucas, love you, Haley. And always in response, they'll say, love you too. But how much better is it when my kids, unprompted, say, I love you, Dad. Where's your love for the Father? Do you have love for your Father in heaven? He has love for you. He can't force you to love him. You know, maybe you like this younger son, you walked away from him. And God let you do it. Why? Because he loves you and he knows he cannot force you to love him in return. But I want you to know he's waiting and he will run to meet you if you come home. That's his heart for you. So whether you feel like you've offended God, you are still welcome to come home because we see that, of course, as we continue to go through the story, that's what the younger son did. He offended this father in one of the worst ways possible, but he still came home. But what did it take for him to come home? Our our scripture, the verse says that he came to himself. Other translations would say that he came to his senses. So when is it going to take sometimes for people to come home? You'll come home when you come to your senses. Now you could say, that's kind of an offensive statement. And I would say, well, that's just what the verse says. Take it up with Jesus. I don't know what to tell you. You will come home when you come to your senses. But but I mention that because that's what it took for this, this son. He thought... If I could just get some of my father's inheritance, if I could get some of what he has and go and live elsewhere, I'll live better than I could in my own father's house. That's what he was thinking. But of course, it didn't turn out well for him. Think about who this young man was. He was the the Jewish son of a wealthy landowner because Jesus is sharing this parable. Jews are all sitting around. That's who he's talking to. So that's what they understand. The Jewish son of a wealthy landowner. And what does he become? a pig herder for a Gentile. You can't go any lower than that. He was at his lowest of lows. And it says that he came to himself. He came to his senses. And I want us to pay attention to what this son said. When he finally came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here in hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. So he came to his senses. He had to go to the lowest of lows to come to his senses. But could I encourage you this morning, if you're not yet at home with God, please don't wait till you're at your lowest of lows to come home. If you're there today and you know you're not at home with God, come home today. Don't wait and then be baptized. Let's just get it all done. Let's come home today, no matter where you find yourself. And and maybe you've got somebody that you know. In fact, most people do. Somebody that's near to your heart but far from God. You know how you start praying? Oh God, help my brother come to his senses. Oh God, help my parents come to their... That's an okay thing to pray because that's what it takes. And you don't know what it takes for that person to come to their senses. It could be the warm hug of a a spouse or a child, the twinkle in a toddler's eyes. You know, the holidays can sometimes spur someone on to come to their senses. They, They look through a family album. They look at a picture and God begins to whisper to their hearts. Remember what it was like when? Remember how you lived then? You are still my son. You are still my daughter. Won't you come home? Start praying. If you have people near to your heart, they're far from God. Oh God, let them come to their senses. But I also want us to pay attention to what it took for this young man to come to his senses. What did it take? It took that young man falling on hard times. So I always like to encourage people, look, don't be surprised if when you begin to pray that Those individuals, maybe they're going to walk through some hardships. But here's what I would pray. Don't pray those hardships are gone. Pray those hardships are used to bring them back to the kingdom. Pray that way. 
God doesn't create suffering. He doesn't cause suffering. That's a result of the fall, but he will use it for his kingdom purposes. So may he use hardship in somebody else's life that they might come home and be celebrated. So where are you at today? Have you come home? Are you at home with God? If not, man, come to yourself, as the passage says, and come home today. Do you know, have lost loved ones that that don't know God, they're not at home with him? Begin to pray for them. They come to their senses and, and watch what God begins to do. Because here's what happens. Once they come home, once you come home, then you get to regain your God-given identity. When you come home, you regain your God-given identity. I love how the story relates that while the sun was still a far way off, but sometimes we misread that because we think about an American farm. Our American farmland's here. You know, if you drive around, usually the farmer lives on the farm property. Well, that's not the way a farm is in the Middle East. People had lived in the village And then they had farms all around the outside of that village. That's why it says the sun came in from the field. So what this means is is this father actually lived in the village. So what is he doing? He is standing and when the sun approaches the village, he runs to him. And that's the first thing that says, well, that father loved his son because I'll tell you, living in the Middle East, nobody runs anywhere. That father loved his son. It would have been undignified for him as a wealthy landowner to run to his son, but he didn't care. He was going to go meet his son. And it was important that he did because the servants in his house were wondering, how are we supposed to treat this son who offended his father by saying, I wish he was dead? The townspeople were wondering, how are we supposed to treat this boy who sold part of his father's property and it's brought hardship on our community? So the father runs to the edge of town before those townspeople can abuse the son. That's a loving father who says, I'm going to stand in the way and I'm going to show these people that when my son comes home, he's welcome back into full fellowship with me. I'm going to give him. Who do we think the best robe of the house belonged to? The father. He says, go put my robe on him. Put one of my rings on him in servants. You're going to serve him too. So wash his feet and put on some shoes. That father goes after the son and he regains everything that he had lost. And that's why it's important that we find our home in God. I want us to look at, I love the parallel nature of this passage. I wanna jump to the next slide so I can show you that. What does the son do at the front end? He leaves, he's in need, that's why he wanted those resources, but he's unrepentant. He doesn't want anything to do with his father. He becomes a pig herder. He eats nothing and he's dying. This is what it looks like to live without God. But now he's come home. And what does it look like? The son returned. He's in need, but now he's repentant. He knows what he did was wrong. He becomes an honored son. He's not a pig herder. He eats on a fattened calf. He's not starving. And now he's no longer dying. He's partying. So where do you find yourself today? If you're not at home with God, Why would you want to stay there when this is the promise you have in him? This is the redemptive nature of God, that that which was wrong, he makes right. That which was crooked, he puts straight. Live at home with God. You're welcome to be in full fellowship with him as a son or daughter. That not only can we sing about being a child of God, we get to be a child of God. Have you claimed your identity in him? And then once you've claimed your identity as a child of God, we also need to help others find their identity too. We must help the lost come home. We must help the lost in the greater Lafayette area come home. We must help the lost around the world come home. How are we doing? How are we doing in helping others find their way home? Because the other character in this story this morning is the older brother. And I'll tell you, he wasn't doing a very good job. Because in the Middle East, in the relationships that existed there, he was not fulfilling the responsibilities of an older brother. I shared with you on the front end of the story, obviously the father and the younger son, they were not in good relationship. Otherwise, the younger son would not have wished his dad dead. So what the older son was supposed to do when that younger son made the statement is he should have grabbed that younger son and said, what are you thinking, man? He should have thrown him on the ground, wrestled him like a good older brother, smacked him around a little bit and said, wake up. You need to figure this stuff out. 
His job was to reconcile relationships in his family. But he didn't do it. So what does that say about the older brother? He obviously didn't hold a whole lot of love for his younger brother. I also don't think he had a lot of love for his older, for his father either. This older brother, he lacked love. And how do we know that? Because what does he complain about to the father? So he comes home, he doesn't go into the party, and so that was the other part of the responsibility he had. He was supposed to be the host for the party, welcoming people to the party, but does he take that on? No, he sits outside. So he didn't care that the younger son offended the father, saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. And at the same time, he didn't care to offend his father by sitting outside the party. All of the townspeople would have understood this as an offense that the older son was committing to the father. But that father still comes outside. But we know that that older son lacked love for his family because what does he desire? He says, Father, you've never given me even a goat, not to party with his family, but to party with some friends. This older son, he lacked love for his father and his brother. And because he lacked love, he would not fulfill the responsibilities that was being asked of him. A couple of weeks ago, I shared a message where Jesus summarizes the the commands of new covenant believers. He says that you are to love others as I have loved you. Asking the question, what does love require of me? And if that older brother would have asked the question of himself, what does love require of me? The answer would have been, I'm supposed to reconcile the relationship between my younger brother and my father. I'm supposed to go serve as a host for this party. But because he lacked love, it kept him back from engaging in who he was supposed to be as a son in his father's household. Think about this father who comes out in humility there too. So he runs to meet his younger son who offended him. He goes out to visit with the older son who's created this offense as well. And he begins to share with his son and dialogue with him about who he is and and why wouldn't he come into the party. But what does the son say? I want to read this verse here. Because we can sometimes miss that the son doesn't even refer to himself as a son. What does he say? Father, I have served you this many years. Not I have been a son, the oldest son in your household for many years. I have served you. But what does the father do in both of the cases of the younger son and the older son? If you notice the speech for the younger son, he's prepared this speech that he's going to come to the father and say, I'm no longer worthy to be your son I want to become a hired servant. But what you'll notice when he goes to meet the father, what does the father do? He cuts him off before he can say, I want to be your hired servant. The younger son doesn't even include that statement. Why? Because the father isn't just looking for servants. He wants sons. And he's saying to the older son, you know, the son says, I served you this many years. But what does he say? Son, you've been with me all of these years. All that I have is yours. So the, one of the other questions we need to answer this morning is, is how are you living? Are you living simply as a servant or are you also living as a son or daughter of the King of Kings? Have you taken that identity on? And if you've taken that identity on, it comes with both privileges of living in a, the household of God, but it also comes with responsibilities to say, and I'm now meant to host others too. You know, we've got lots of people that serve here on a Sunday morning. They serve wearing those you're invited t-shirts. Why? Because they take on the responsibility to say, we're meant to host the people that come into this space, that come into this place. So I would put before you this morning, are you serving as a host in some capacity? Are you helping others come home? If not, you're meant to. In fact, you really can't achieve that identity of being a son or daughter of the king until you do. You're more than a servant, you're a son or a daughter of the King of Kings. You're meant to find your home with God. This older brother, this older brother who, who said uh, that I have served you this many years, what's a father say? You've lived with me these many years. So what does that mean? That we can all come together, but if we're not at home with God, we can still not be at home with him. So have you found your home with God? Are you living in the abundance that is his, or are we living with a scarcity mentality? I encourage you, live with God as your home. The interesting thing about this parable is it doesn't give us the ending. We don't know what happens. We don't know what happens with the older brother. What does he decide to do? 
I, I want to throw up a slide that shows you th- this story is created and it's called a chiasmus so that you can find where the point is, but also you can find how is the story supposed to end. So what happens, the older son, he comes and he, the, he asks the servant and the servant says, your younger brother has returned, he's safe, we're having a feast. And so then the father comes out, wants to reconcile with the older brother. The older brother, he complains once, he complains twice. And so then the father still again tries to reconcile with the brother saying, all that I have is yours. And we had to celebrate. Your brother is safe. We're having a feast. But now we don't know. On the top end, it says that he comes, but what is the brother going to do? Two different endings. What's going to be the ending to your story? Here's the two options. And the older son came and entered the house and joined in the music and dancing, and he began to make merry. And the two sons were reconciled to their father. May this be the ending to your story. Because otherwise, option two is, but the older son remained outside and missed the party and remained unreconciled to his brother and his father. So are you at home with God today? Are you at home with him? Are you in good relationship with God the Father? If not, choose to come home today and be celebrated today. You're meant to live with God at the center. How much better could your life be if you knew that you were at peace with God, that you were at home with him? How much better do you feel like you could interact with others if you were in good relationship with God, which helps you to be in good relationship with other people too? Your life can look different when you're at home with God. I invite you to stand as we close in song this morning. And as you're standing, I want to ask that question. You know, you've come into this space this morning and maybe you've been far from God, you've not been at home with him, but today you would say, I want to come home to God. I want to regain my identity in him. So if that's you today, you're ready to come home with every head bowed in this room. You have that invitation today. We want to celebrate you. If that's you today, you'd say, I want to come home today. Simply raise your hand. I want to pray with you before we leave today. Anybody would say, that's me. I want to come home today. I want to regain my God-given identity. I want the privileges of being a son or daughter of the king. I want to know God as my father today. God, I just ask that you would help each and every one in this room to live in their full identity in you. Lord, that the abundant life that you have offered us, Lord, I pray that we would offer it to others too. God, what this story shares is that that we can be near you, but not be at home with you. And so God, I just pray that that would not be the case for anyone here today. Lord, that if they're in this room today, that they'd be at home with you, that they would have that close relationship with you that, that you desire. Lord, you can't force us to love you, but it's your heart that we do. And so God, we just want to tell you this morning that we love you. We thank you, God, for sending your son. We just don't take that for granted. And so, God, I thank you that we can be in right relationship with you because of Jesus' death on the cross and that we can live forever with you because of his resurrection from the dead. And so, God, I pray uh, as we close in song this morning that we would just declare praises to you and the worth that you uh, have, all the praises that you are due, Lord. I just pray that we would sing and celebrate that we can be at home with you today. We pray these things in Jesus' name.